Hi, my name is Craig Lowen, and I'm here today to talk to you all about the Windows subsystem for Linux, which we commonly shorten down to WSL. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the latest and greatest feature coming to WSL, which is WSL2. Let's let you run a lot more Linux apps with 100% system call compatibility, and lets you run them a lot faster with significantly increased file I.O. performance. <laughs> So what exactly is the Windows subsystem for Linux anyway? Well, WSL allows you to run your favorite Linux command line tools, utilities, and applications all directly on Windows. They're all totally unmodified, and you're running actual L64 Linux binaries. You can even access your Windows files from that environment and run Windows executables. Uh, if you want to learn more about WSL in general, please check out our docs. Today we're going to be focusing on the Windows subsystem for Linux 2, which is the latest version. <laughs> What cool new things can you do in WSL2? Well, the two main features of WSL2 are faster file I.O. performance and 100% system call compatibility. So with faster file I.O. performance, all of your system calls that go to write, reading and writing files will go way faster. This means when you're doing things like sudo apt update, sudo apt install, or pip install, or npm install, or git clone, you will notice a significant file performance increase. In general, this will be about three to six times a performance increase, depending on how file I.O. intensive the operation you are running is. Um, this will also be shown across all of your different distros that are running inside of WSL2. On top of this, the second half is system call compatibility. With 100% system call compatibility, you can run a lot more apps inside of WSL. This means apps such as Docker, will run, as well as Fuse and more. And with Docker, you can actually containerize all of your workflows directly in WSL2. So jumping into our first demo, let's take a look at exactly how much faster is WSL2 compared to WSL1. So on my laptop here, I have Windows Terminal running. On the left side, I have WSL2 running in this preview pane. And on the right side, I have WSL1. And what we're going to do is run time sudo apt install python. And we'll first start that off in WSL1, and we'll run the exact same command in WSL2. So as they build, you'll notice that WSL2 is a lot faster. It's actually about three to six times faster, depending on what you're doing. Um, this is something that is dependent on how file I.O. intensive the operation that you're running is. If you do something like unzipping a tarball, you can actually get to about 20 times faster, which is a huge improvement. You're going to notice this when you do things like sudo apt update install, which you're going to do all the time. Uh, as well as git clone and npm install. At the end of the day, once these are completed, we see that WSL2 ran this operation in just 14 seconds, while WSL1 took a minute and 24, 25 seconds. So that's about five to six times faster, uh, which is something that you're for sure going to notice on any file I.O. operation that you're going to do in WSL. <laughs> What apps can I now run in WSL2 that I couldn't in WSL1? Well, in WSL2, we have 100% system call compatibility, which is powered by an actual Linux kernel. And so this lets you run a ton of more apps and empower you to do a lot more developer workflows. For example, you can run Docker and do container workflows, as well as Fuse and more. Uh, so let's jump into what this actually looks like by taking a look over here on my laptop. So I'm in my Ubuntu distro. I'm at my home folder. I'm going to go into my View Apps folder and take a look at a ghost game. So here, uh, I have the Docker container service running in the back end. And I'm going to run sudo docker compose up. This is going to start up my containers using docker compose. I have two containers that I'm running. The first is a View App front end server. So it's serving a web server that is powering a View App front end. And the other half is a WebSocket server. So this is allowing you to have multiple browser windows that will be talking to each other across the server uh, to have a game that will be played across multiple browser windows. So now that the servers have started, I can flip on over to take a look at what that looks like. Once I refresh this, we can see that I have some chocolate on the left and a reset button. If I click this in one browser, it will actually play the reset command across both. And when I lose this game inside one browser, it will lose it in both. And this is powered through having those different Docker containers talking to each other. What's really exciting about this is this is also powered by Docker Desktop for Windows. So the Docker Desktop team has added in the, the latest stable version a new 
optional component that you can check inside of your settings. So if I open up the settings page of my Docker desktop for Windows app, I see that there's an enable the experimental WSL2 based engine option here. I can click that and now my Docker service is running inside of WSL2. And so I can access that with my WSL app as I showed here, or I can open up PowerShell and I can run my Docker commands from here as well, like Docker image LS. And I can see those Docker images that I built 27 minutes ago, which were the exact ones that I just ran to power this experience. Let's take a look at how you can use VS Code and WSL together to create an awesome developer environment. So jumping back in, I'm going to go back into my Linux environment from PowerShell. So goodbye in PowerShell, we'll close you down. And we're going to run code dot. This is going to open up VS Code Remote. VS Code Remote is an extension inside of VS Code that makes a remote server run in WSL. What this means is only the UI is running in Windows. Everything else is running entirely in Linux. So I have my site already open, and on the bottom left, you can see there's a WSL Ubuntu option here. This shows that you're running in a remote context. And if I hover over these files, you'll see a Linux file path. Uh, this is because it, we're developing exactly like you would on a Linux machine. And when I go and open up my integrated terminal, I get access to Bash right away. Uh, so I can start programming as I would in a Linux environment. So I'm going to go and CD into my site folder, and I'm going to run npm serve. And we're running this site not in a container now. We're running it locally, actually, inside of my distro. Now that it's running there, uh, the front end is completed. So we'll close that down so we don't need to see it. And the other half of this is here in this folder called socket logic. And this contains the Node.js half, which is the other Docker container that we ran. Uh, that powers the server that communicates among the web sockets to coordinate the experiences across the browsers. And we can go and actually debug this app. So if we run this um, in debug mode, then we can start up the app and we can see what the debugger is seeing. So WebSocket is ready for connections. And here we can reload our app. And now we're running with that debugger based inside of Linux. And if I open this back up, we can actually set breakpoints here. So if I go down to this line of code, this is just saying if there are, we receive a reset, reset message from one of our containers or one of the apps that we're connected to, then we need to reset. And so we'll set a breakpoint here. And if I close this and I hit reset, then we notice that nothing happens. This is because we're actually paused down here in this debugger. The pause is showing that we've hit this breakpoint. And you can actually go in and take a look at all the different variables that you have, like the message is reset. You can take a look at the call stack. And just to really prove that we're running on Linux, I created an extra variable here called my platform, and it says Linux. So we're actually running this as a full Linux process and debugging through it. So VS Code works really well with the Microsoft Edge browser as well with WSL. Um, we're running this on localhost, so it's all a highly integrated and highly connected experience. You don't have to feel like you're developing on a totally separate machine. Everything feels like it's under the same box. To get WSL2 working on your machine, the first thing you need to do is make sure you are on the latest version of Windows that supports WSL2. So to do that, it will be generally available in the first half of 2020. If you want to get it right away, you can always join the Windows Insider program, and it's available on the fast ring or the slow ring. So join any of those. Make sure you are on the correct build of Windows, and then you're ready to start. Once you have the correct build of Windows, we're going to jump on over to my laptop to see what you can do from there. So all you need to do is open up the Start menu, go Turn Windows Features On or Off. This will show you the Optional Components dialog box inside of Windows. Scroll to the bottom and make sure that you have the Windows Subsystem for Linux checked as well as the virtual machine platform option checked. Once those are both checked, you'll need to restart your computer to make sure they're totally installed. And from there, we're going to open up a new tab on PowerShell. From here, you can go WSL-L-V. This will list all your distros in a verbose manner. So you can see all the distros that I have running as well as what version they are. So here I have an Alpine distro as a version 1 distro. And to convert it over, all I need to do is do WSL dash dash set dash version Alpine to 2. It will convert. Once its conversion is complete, then I can just run it right away. I can run WSL dash D will run my Alpine distribution. And if I ever want to go back to version 1, then I can run WSL dash dash set dash version Alpine 1. And this will convert it back right away. 
And if you like WSL so much that you want to make WSL 2 your default, you can run WSL dash dash set dash default dash version 2, and then this will make WSL 2 your default version. So now anytime you install a new distro, it will install automatically as a WSL 2 distro. <laughs> We did a lot of work behind the scenes to make WSL2 possible. To fully explain all of the architecture changes that we did, first you need to understand the architecture of WSL1, which is the current version that's widely available. In WSL1, we have a translation-based approach. So we have actual Linux user space binaries that are provided by the maintainers, like Canonical, Debian, OpenSUSE. These are the actual binaries that run, and whenever they have a system call, like accessing memory or files or network, they call down to the WSL translation layer. We translate these system calls from a Linux system call to a Windows system call. And then that goes down to the Windows NT kernel. The NT kernel sends a response back up to our translation layer. We translate that back to something that Linux would understand. And at the end of the day, we've implemented the application binary interface for Linux. This worked great because everything ran under the same kernel. However, there were some challenges. Windows and Linux have very different semantics. And so this could be complicated, especially when these semantics were diametrically opposed from each other. In WSL2, we moved to a virtualization-based approach rather than a translation layer. So we have your distro, which is all your user space binaries, and we've put that inside of a lightweight utility VM. This is a VM that is really fast. It boots up in under a second um, and does not hog tons of resources on your machine. And we've put a real Linux kernel inside of this. This is a kernel that is built by Microsoft, maintained by Microsoft, and is totally open source. And all the source code is available on GitHub. Whenever you have a system call from your Linux user space binaries, it calls down to this kernel and is immediately responded. So this means that you don't have to go through this translation layer, which is what leads to 100% system call compatibility and way faster file I.O. performance. At the end of the day, this all runs on the Windows hypervisor layer uh, to power this VM. And we've also included all of your favorite Windows uh, integration features with WSL, such as accessing all your Windows files and running Windows executables straight from this Linux environment. I prefer spaces to tabs, and that's because tabs don't actually have a denotation of how wide or short they have to be and in indentations. So that's totally done by your IDE. So if you open it up in a different IDE, it might have a different level of indentation. If you use spaces, it will always have the same indentation level uh, if you're using a fixed width font. But however, I still use the tab key, and I just make my editor insert spaces for me. Thanks for joining us to take a look at how you can use the Windows subsystem for Linux 2 to power your Linux development workflows, including running containers with Docker Desktop for Windows, using faster file I.O. perf, and making use of that 100% system call compatibility. We have a lot more links for you to take a look at if you want to dive deeper into everything WSL. You can check out our docs, learn how to install WSL 2, learn where to file issues, watch our blog for any WSL news, and as well, you can check out our ghost game source code. So this is the game that we demoed today. You can see exactly how we made that possible. And you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Craig A. Lowen. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching Tabs versus Spaces. Please like and subscribe, and look out for new episodes coming soon. <laughs>